Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd, I'd invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4. We're going to be in John chapter 4, um, and, and it will be up on the screen if you don't have your Bibles with you or for those of you at home. But, but I, love, I love when I can have my Bible physically in my hand. You know, there's something about that. And so this morning, as we look at John chapter 4, what we're going to be talking about is, is listening with care. And, and as, as Michael and I have, have met and as we've, as we've talked together, I love the series that you guys are, are in right now. And as you're talking about what, what does it look like to share Jesus um, in ordinary life? What does, that, what does that look like? How do we do that? Even if we're not, even if we're not gifted evangelists, which, which I'm not, I don't know about you, but I would say I'm not a gifted evangelist. And yet, what does it look like for, for those of us who, who claim to be Christians, who claim to be Christ followers, who Jesus says, you, you, are, you are my witness to, to the nations. You, you are my witness. So what does it look like for us to, to share Jesus in ordinary life? And I think part of that is, is this idea of listening with care. And, and even as I was putting together this, uh, this sermon for this morning, I, I was kind of playing devil's advocate with myself, and I kept thinking, all right, I, am I saying that if I just listen to somebody well enough, they'll come to a saving knowledge of Jesus? And, and I think the answer is no. <laughs> but at the same time, as we think about what does it look like to listen with care as a, as a part of this, this blessed series, as a part of what does it look like to share Jesus, it is part of it because that's, that's even what we see Jesus doing in his own earthly ministry, right? Because here's the question, how many of you, how many of you, if, if you just get the right information, that changes your behavior? How many of you? Like, it, it, what you need to really change your behavior is just, is just for, for maybe one more book. For you to, to keep your New Year's resolution is just for you to, to, to read the right book or the right blog post or listen to the right podcast. That's all you need. I don't know about you, but that's definitely not me. And, and that's not most of the people that, that I've interacted with. You see, the reality is that correct information rarely leads to behavior change, right? If you don't, if, if you don't think that's true, I mean, those of you who have kids can, right, can you? And, and it's, easy, it's easy to think about our kids, you know, because, you know, sometimes with kids, it's like, well, if I just explain to them that every time they leave the lights on, we pay more in electrical bill, that, that'll change their behavior, Right? <laughs> and, and it's easy, it's easy to pick on kids, but it's the same for us as, as grown adults. I mean, how many, look, we went to, we got the, the privilege to go to Southeast Asia and work with missionaries and um, again with my wife, uh, she's an incredible counselor and, and she's been teaching me a ton and, and we've gotten to go different places in the world and we went to Southeast Asia. It was crazy because um, it seemed like everybody was smoking there. And, and it, you know, with, uh, with there here, we have, I, I used to smoke, uh, praise God, I don't anymore. I used to smoke cigarettes, and, and on a pack of cigarettes, uh, big, bold letters, it says, these are bad, in, in so many words, right? These are bad for you. Don't smoke these. On the packs of cigarettes, don't smoke these. Well, in, in Asia, they, they not only have that warning from the Surgeon General, I don't know what it is over there, but they have pictures, of what happens to you if you continue to smoke. It's crazy. Like, I mean, big sores and, you know, people who lose their jaws because, I mean, like lungs that have, have been, and it's right on the pack of cigarettes that people take this, you know, and, and just continue to smoke. See, correct information rarely leads to behavior change. And yet, correct information applied correctly can. Correct information applied correctly can. And so the question is, well, how do we apply correct information correctly? I think from Proverbs, we kind of see a little bit inside of, of what that looks like. Proverbs 18, 13 um, says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. If one gives an answer before he what? I like group participation. If one gives an answer before he what? hears. It is his folly and shame. It is his foolishness. If we run into a situation and say, hey, I, I got it. I got it. This is what you need before you, before you understand what's happening. The, the wisest man who ever lived says that's foolishness. Proverbs 18.15 says, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. The what of the wise seeks knowledge? The ear of the wise seeks knowledge. What we think is the tongue. 
the mouth, the mind. But what the wisest man who ever lives says is the ears of the wise seeks knowledge. How do ears seek knowledge? By listening, right? By listening. I mean, again, Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. A purpose in a man's heart is deep water. Deep water, you don't really know what's under there, do you? You, you don't know what's going on in deep water. But it says a man of understanding will draw it out. From Proverbs eighteen fifteen. how do we know how a man of understanding draws it out? The ear of the wise seeks knowledge. See, I believe that as we, as we look at what does it look like to share Jesus in ordinary life, what, is it, what does it look like to listen with care, how we apply correct information is first, first we need to take the time to draw out what's happening in those around us. And the way we do that is we listen. We take time to be with people. And it's the same thing that we see in Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 4, we see the, the interaction with the woman at the well. And, and I'm sure that you've heard countless sermons on this. I'm sure that, that you've read it over and over and over again. And yet, I believe as we look at Jesus' interaction with this woman, in this, in this concept of what does it look like to, to share Jesus in the ordinary life, and how do we do that by listening with care, I think we see some things that we can take away from that are so needed in the cultural moment that we live in. If we just stop to listen. Read with me. Um, John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We're going to read 1 to 7. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Let's just stop there for a second. The first thing that I think that we need to take away from, from this idea of listening with care as we look at uh, how does Jesus do this, what does Jesus do to listen with care, is the first thing that we see is he puts himself in a position to hear this woman. He puts himself in a position to hear this woman. And what I'm talking about is, is primarily geographical, right? Right? Uh, it, it says in this, it says that, that Jesus, I love, I love any time you see Jesus like gaining crowds, he's like, oh, time to go. Right? He's, he's not about building a huge ministry. He's not about being king. He's not about, he's not about uh, g- growing the crowds. He's about more people experiencing the freedom that comes through, through him. And so when he sees crowds gathering, he says, all right, let's go to the next place. And it says that he wants to go to Galilee, and they're in, in Judea, which is in the south. If you're looking at a map of, of uh, Israel during this time, um, Jerusalem, Judea is in the south, Galilee is in the north, and Samaria is right in the middle. And, and I love that it says that he had, John records, he had to go through Samaria. See, so the reality is, is he didn't. Can, can I say that a, a biblical author is, is incorrect? <laughs> and what I mean by that is a good Jew wouldn't have gone through Samaria to go from Judea to Galilee. See what, what happened. So if, if we, I want to stay within the frame of the, of the camera for the people at home. But if, if we were to say, all right, this is the south, Jerusalem, Judea. And, and over here at this, at this edge is, is the north, Galilee, where the, the Sea of Galilee is, where Jesus walked on water, cast out demons, fed 5,000 people. Over here is where, where uh, Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucified, you know, uh, put in the tomb, resurrected. Uh, so so if, if a good Jew was going to go from, from here to there, we have this, the, the Jordan River running up the side. I'm not a, I'm not a good, you know, geography isn't good for me. But, but the, the Jordan River's running up the side. The Dead Sea's over here. Sea of Galilee's up there. What they would do is instead of going straight, which you would think, okay, we got a journey. Let's just go straightest route. What they would do was they would cross over the Jordan River they would come clear out around, they'd swing around, and then they'd hang back, and they'd wind up over here in Galilee. Now, why did they do that? Because they hated Samaritans. 
I'm sure you've heard this before. They hated Samaritans. The reason they hated Samaritans, because Samaritans were the people who hundreds of years before the, the Assyrian army came in and they, they took them into captivity and then they brought other people, other, other religions, idol worship, other, other uh, uh, Gentile people came in and, and the Jewish people in this area intermarried. And then they, they took the, the Jewish religion and mixed it in with all the other religions. And so the Jewish people in the north, or in the south and the north, I'm getting my directions mixed up, in the, in the south and the north saw these, these people in the middle as completely unclean. They didn't want to be around them. They didn't want to, they didn't want to interact with them. They, they hated these people. And this goes far beyond like Democrat-Republican hatred. This goes far beyond anything we can think about right now. I mean, they, they believed if their shadow, if a Samaritan shadow crossed their shadow, then they were unclean. They couldn't even be around him. And so when John says he had to go through Samaria, he's talking about something different than just, than just well, that's the straightest line. He's talking about something different. He's talking about something more than just geography. He's talking about the fact that Jesus had an appointment with this woman in Samaria that he had to keep. Not only did, did he say this about geography, not only can we, can we talk about that with geography, but it was, what time of day was it? It was the sixth hour, right? The sixth hour was about noon. You can Google it. It was about noon. See, this was not the time that, that women came to draw water in this culture, that's not, you, you don't go, my son, he mows lots of, lots of lawns, and he's even realized, like, you don't go mow a yard in the hottest time of the day, right? These people, they didn't go in this culture, in this climate, they didn't go get water, which was an arduous task, in the hottest time of the day. They went when it was cool, in the mornings, but this woman comes in the hottest time of the day. Why? She's an outcast, Right? See, Jesus comes, he, it says he had to go here, so he went to a place he didn't necessarily have to go at a time that he didn't necessarily have to be there. Why? Because he wanted to put himself in a position to hear this woman. How often, how often would we say that's us? How often would we say that we put ourselves in position to actually hear the people around us? I mean, just think about, think about your own agenda, Oftentimes, I, I heard a speaker saying one time that, you know, used to be a uh, long time, long time ago, that front, uh, front porches were bigger than back decks. Why? Because you wanted to interact with your neighbors. Because we were a communal culture more than now. And now our, we don't even have a front porch on our house. We have a big back deck, but we don't have a front porch. And, and oftentimes what we do is we come home from work and we're tired and, and, and all this stuff and life just happens. And so the garage door opens, we go in, garage door closes. We don't see anybody else. We like to keep our world small. We like to keep it controlled. It, it reminds me, I always joke, like when I go get groceries, I go for one thing, usually. You know, it's like if I'm going for milk, it's milk. Like, get the milk, get the milk, get the milk, right? I, I don't want to see. We used to live in a small town in Iowa, and, and you go to, you know, small town grocery stores. It was like the places that people talk to people. And it's like grocery stores is the place you get groceries. That's not the place you go talk. You know, so I'd go, I'd go to our small grocery store. It's like, get the milk, get the milk, get the milk. I turn down, it's like, oh, no. Hopefully they didn't see me, right? And then I, I try and go around the aisle because I don't want to get into a conversation in a grocery store because I'm there to get milk. See, that's what happens with our, with our agendas, with our, with our time, with our, with our lives. We don't want to put ourselves in a position where we might have a conversation that's outside of what we had planned to do because that might mess up our plans, right? And yet Jesus, he put himself in a position because he had an appointment with this woman. Not, not only that, not only do we, do we try and keep our agendas tight and, and controlled, but we don't want to typically hear anybody that's going to sound different than us. Right? In, in this culture, in this climate that we live in, we don't want to hear if, if somebody is a part of this movement or that movement that's, that's different than ours. I don't care why they're a part of it. I don't care, I don't care what, they, what good they see in it if it's different than what I believe. It's like when, when I was talking to my dad at, at one time when I was much younger and much more foolish, I wanted to get my ears pierced, which you can maybe see I have holes in my ears, so it happened. But I was talking to my dad and I was saying, hey dad, I want to I get my ears pierced. 
What do you think about that? Oh, I think that's stupid. <laughs> okay. Um, well, can, can you help me understand, like, what, what, what do you, why, well, why would you, that's stupid, that's, you know, it's like, we, we couldn't have, I love my dad, I love my dad, but we couldn't have a conversation uh, outside of, uh, you know, just that being the stupidest thing ever. He didn't, he didn't ask me, he didn't want to know maybe why, he didn't, he didn't want to, want to hear uh, any desires that I might have had, which I probably didn't have any, I didn't, probably didn't think about it further than that. But we didn't have a, a conversation because it was outside of what he might have wanted to hear. That's where we live. That's, that, that, is, that is the cultural moment that we live in. And oftentimes what we do, especially for those of you on social media, if we see something outside of what we want, we unfriend them very quickly, don't we? We unfriend, we, we move away from. And yet Jesus comes into a place that is very culturally different with different beliefs and different mindsets and, and all these different things because he wanted to hear this woman. He had an appointment with this woman. And so he, he put himself in a position to hear. Let's, let's keep reading and see what, what happens after that. Verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans like we just talked about. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and, and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> Isn't that such a, I, every time I read that, I can't help but giggle, because it's such an interesting response. Oh, well, let's not talk about me, let's talk about you. I see you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Not only does Jesus put himself in a position to hear this woman, geographical, uh, cultural, not only does he put himself in a position to hear this woman, but he meets her where she's at. Do you see that? Where does their conversation start? What do they start talking about? Water. Why do they talk about water? They're at a well, right? They're at a well. It goes from water, then it goes to the, the cultural uh, situation that she finds herself in, and then it goes to worship, and then it goes to Messiah. Do you see the progression there? They, they start talking about water because they're at a well, and, and, and Jesus is tired, and he's thirsty, and, and so they begin to talk about water. But, but it doesn't stay at water very long. Then it goes deeper. It goes, it goes, all right, here's water. What's under that? What's under your need? What's under your desire? And then, and then it goes to the cultural moment. She, this woman is a culture. Can I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and it's a bold statement, but I believe that it's true. This woman is a victim of her culture. Now, now, the reason I say that is for, for so long when I would read this story and when she would respond, and she said, well, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right that you have no husband. You're right to say that because you've had five husbands. 
and the one you live with now is not your husband. I, I always used to read that as like, oh, 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 she got caught, right? Like, oh man, Jesus, Jesus reading her mail. But recently I heard a, I heard a, a person talking about if you read this in context of what the, the cultural moment, see a woman in this culture, it was not up to her generally, it was not up to her whether or not she stayed married, right? In, in Jewish culture during this time, uh, a man could divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever. If she burned his food, divorce. I mean, if he didn't like what she was saying, divorce. Like it, it, was, it was so easy to write out a certificate of divorce, hand it to her, and then she was out. And when a woman was given a certificate of divorce, it was either a death sentence or she had to figure out something real quick because she had no way of caring for herself in this culture. She wasn't going to go out and get a part-time job. There was, no, there was no social structures to help her. And so... Either somebody had compassion on her and took her in, or she turned to prostitution, or she died. This woman had, has had five husbands. What does that mean for her? Five different times, and I don't want to speak too much into Scripture that, that might not be there, but, but what, we can, what we can assume from the cultural moment is possibly five different times she's been given a certificate of divorce. Five different times she's been found, uh, pushed aside, passed along. Five different times, and now she's living with a man who, who doesn't want to marry her. He just wants to use her. And so when we read this, it's easy for us to, to look and say, oh man, what a bad woman. How, how crazy would that be? She must be a, a, a loose woman. She must be all these different things. And yet when we think about it in the cultural context, she is a victim of her situation, of her culture, and Jesus gets to this place where it's like, hey, we start with water, but I wonder what's under there. Let's talk about who you are. Let's talk about where you've been. I wonder what's under there. I wonder why you're here at this well at, at noon. Can we talk about what's under that? She, goes to, she then goes to worship. And, and she's, she's not necessarily trying to change the subject, even though I, I think we could read it in that way, where it's like, oh, man, you're, have you ever been there? Where it's like, this is getting too real. Worship. Let's talk about worship. And she says, you, you say worship here. We say worship here. What is it? And this is at the core of their cultural divide. The Samaritans, they worshiped on this other mountain. And the, the Jews, even uh, it was a couple hundred years before this situation, they had a temple on this mountain. The Jews came in and destroyed it. And so there's, she's saying, well, you guys, you guys say this. We say this. What's the answer? And yet Jesus says it's, it's about spirit. It's not about situation. It's not about location. It's about the position of your heart. And then she gets to the place where, what does she say? I know Messiah's coming. When he comes, he'll reveal all things. And what does Jesus say? That's me. So we see Jesus go from water to culture to, to worship to, to what, her, what her deep desire is under all those things. And what we get to is a desire to know when the Messiah comes, when the Messiah comes, he'll reveal this. When the Messiah comes and he got to a place because he started where she was, he got to a place where he could reveal who he was. Isn't that amazing? He went from water to Messiah. See, and, and, and what he did was he, he started where she was. He asked questions. He, he went from, from here to there. Oftentimes, what we see, especially as we look at the world around us, we see action. And then we react to the action that we see. Right? It's like the tip of the iceberg. How many of you, you come home and you're kind of, you know, it's been a hard day or whatever, and you're kind of slamming things around, and, and you, you, maybe your wife or your husband is like, hey, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. <laughs> you know, you slam things around, and, and, and then you get into an argument because you slam the door, or you, you know, like wh whatever it is. And, and it's like you get into an argument over the action, which that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? That's just the thing that's seen. And if you would take the time, which is kind of what, what we try and do, is if you would take the time to create a space where it's like, I wonder what's under that. I wonder what's below that. 
I just slammed the door. I just said something really not, not very kind to the kids. I, 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 I wonder what's under there. And yet oftentimes we react to the action that we see around us. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if we took the time to listen with care to see what's under that. When we see movements that, that we don't know, why, why is that going on? People seem angry in the streets. Instead of just reacting because we don't agree with what's on their sign, instead of reacting because we don't agree with why they're on the street, I wonder what would happen if we, as, as the ambassadors of Christ, as the ones who are called to be salt and light to a dark and dying world, I wonder what would happen if we actually took the time to wonder what was under that. And how do we do that? Listen, right? If we, if we said, you know, can you help me understand this? I, I see this all over the place. And, and if, if we just go out and ask, if we just go out and, and, and interact, if we, if we allow our schedules to be taken apart just a little bit and put ourselves in positions where we can hear and don't react just by, because of the actions that we see, the tip of the iceberg, knowing that, man, maybe there is there's a lot more under there than what we what we had ever known. Maybe, I wonder, I wonder if we could go from water to Messiah if we actually stop to listen. I love what happens after this. If we keep reading, verse 27, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now, now I want to, I want to stop there. I want to, this is where I kind of want to land the plane. Okay. Because what happens after that, the disciples, we're not going to read it, but the disciples, they're saying, Jesus eat, Jesus eat. Cause they just went in town and got food. They come back and he's saying, Jesus eat. And he's saying, I, I've eaten. And they're like, are you kidding me? We went to town and got food. And you? he's like, no, the, the food that I have is to do the will of my father. And he tells them, he says, he says, look up. Look, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ready. What do you think he's asking them to look at? We just read that all the people, it says, verse 30, they went out of the town and were coming to him. And as Jesus is saying, Look, guys, elevate your thinking. Look, I believe what he's asking them to look at is all these people that are coming up from the town, possibly that they were just in to get food. They were coming out to meet Jesus. This man who just told this woman all that she ever did, this man who told this woman, he, he met her at her base desire, her base needs. And he says, I am the fulfillment of that. I am the fulfillment. You've been passed on and you've been victimized and all these things. Guess what? I'm here. And he tells them, guys, look, they need the same thing. And then, and then again, if we, if we skip forward into verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and, and they stayed there two days, and many more believed because of the word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's just stop there. This woman goes from being an ostracized victim in her culture to being at the center of a movement of people being free through the power of Jesus. Right? What could happen? What could happen if we, if we took the time and said, I, I want to share Jesus. I, I want to share this hope that I have. I want to share Jesus in ordinary life. That's what I want to do. I wonder what would happen if we took the time, again, to let our agendas be, be wrecked. If we took the time to maybe talk to our neighbor, if we took the time to maybe wonder what was under all of, all of those actions that we see, not to react and not to say, I can't believe they would say this. I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe. But if we would stop and say, I wonder what's under that. Corona has, has upset so many plans. It is bringing so much fear. 
like the, the, the topics of race and, and politics and all these different things are bringing out so much that people are feeling and, and so much hurt, so much fear. And yet we, the people of God, have the answer we have, we have the, the, I mean, we have Jesus who, who says, hey, yeah, the world is going to be hard, but take heart because I have overcome the world. We have Jesus who came and died for us, who has set us free, that we don't have to be bound by sin. We don't have to be bound by those things. We don't even have to fear death. Paul says, man, to be, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. What do I choose? Isn't that crazy? He's like, do I stay alive? Do I die? I don't know. Like, if it were me, I'd be like, alive? That sounds better. But we as believers in Christ and followers of Christ, we don't even have to fear death. What could happen if we actually took the time to put ourselves in positions to hear and to meet people where they're at I believe that as we watch this woman, this ostracized woman, go from, from being a victim to being a person at the middle of the movement, I think God still wants to do things like that. I think God still wants to take people like you, Centerpoint Church, and I believe he wants to, I believe he wants to, to see more people join the kingdom. But not to just come together not to, just, not to just be, you know, a, a, I don't know, a place where just salt gathers, but to be a place where we gather and then are spread. So that more people get to experience him. So that more people get to experience freedom. So that more people, as they experience fear, they get to go under that and experience Jesus. See, again, we have the right, right news. We, we have correct information. But correct information rarely changes behavior. But correct information applied correctly can. So my prayer for you this week is, I wonder what it would look like for us to take a posture of learner. To to move from being, being frustrated, to move from being offended, to being a position of, of security in Christ and a learner of what's under all those things. Because when it comes to the bottom of all that, the answer truly is Jesus. Amen? Can I pray for us? God, I I thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy to us. I praise you that we can be people who, who don't have to react. God, I praise you that we can be people who, 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 yes, I mean, there, there are fearful things and there, there are hurts in our world. And I'm not trying to downplay the pain that we feel. I'm not trying to downplay any of that. But God, I truly believe that we can respond to pain and fear with the security that we have in you. And God, I pray that I pray for the people of this church that God, that, that maybe this week you would allow them to have their plans interrupted. God, I, I pray that this week there would be, there would be people that you, have, that you have prepared, God. That you have went before them. You've prepared their hearts. You've prepared their minds. You have prepared them to hear you. You've prepared them to, to experience you. And God, I pray this week that there would be times and places where, where these people, where us as your people, allow ourselves to be put in situations where we can hear. And God, I, I just I pray against reaction in that. When we get into those situations, I pray against reaction. I pray that when we get on social media, when we get on Facebook, against whatever it is, I pray against reaction, God. I pray that you would allow us to hear the fear that's underneath the words. Allow us to hear the, the instability that people feel that's under the posts, that's under the pictures. God, I pray that we wouldn't be people who who just react because of the actions, but we would be people who can take it deeper than that. God, bless us. Help us to be your ambassadors. Help us to be people who listen with care so that more people can hear you and experience true freedom. It's in your name. Amen.
timely message, church. You know, last week I gave you the encouragement. At the end of the message, I encourage you to pick two or three people in your life and your influence that are far from God, that need God, and I encourage you to pray for them and to pray for ways that you can interact with them and have times to interact with them. I want to give you an encouragement today, and this encouragement is going to be much more difficult, so it might, it might be more like a challenge, but it's this. Those that you're praying for, those that are different, those who are far from God, listen to them. Now, how do I do that? Well, ask this simple question or make a simple statement. Help me understand. When you're walking through the office at work and you see someone on the office next to you or the cubicle next to you and they've got a Biden sticker, they've got a Trump sticker on the door, hey, help me understand. Where are you coming from? When you see someone's got a Black Lives Matter sticker or a climate change sticker or a pick a political issue, help me understand. And when we do that, then we listen. We don't say, help me understand so I can show you how you're wrong. We listen to get to know that person, to go from the issue. It's a beautiful picture from the water or from whatever the political issue is or whatever the economic issue is, whatever it is, to go deeper to the Messiah. Because when someone feels listened to, that's the feeling they most closely associate with love. Jesus tells us, love God and love the world and love people, right? How do we do that? We listen to them. So I want to encourage you, listen to people this week. See what you might learn about them as a person.